Okay, so we've been looking a little bit at relational evangelism, and I thought it'd be appropriate to spend a little time on what the gospel actually is. Um, it's going to be in two parts. This week, we're going to look at the gospel's you know, major emphasis, and then next week, we'll look at some of the alternative verses. If you look on your screen, oops, let me back over here. Ah, sorry about this. The most, the first thing you discover when you look at the scriptures is that the gospels open up with the gospel of the kingdom. So in Matthew 4, um, John the Baptist comes, Jesus comes, and all the apostles after them, and they say the kingdom of heaven is at hand, uh, repent and believe the good news. And then at the end of Matthew, in chapter 24, verse 14, we're still talking about the gospel of the kingdom. And um, I did a little internet search about what people think the gospel is. And there's one guy who's actually pretty good. He's called uh, God Questions. And probably about 80% of, 80, yeah, 80% of the time, he actually has pretty good, useful information. But he's reflective of most of what people think the gospel is when he says... Um, in the New Testament, the gospel refers to always Christ reigning in the heart of people, um, which is so far from the truth, uh, but it's what's commonly believed. And one of the things that kind of gets me about this is uh, most preachers are basically parrots. Uh, they kind of repeat what they've heard. Um, and even really good guys are susceptible to this because if you're in a context that is everybody's saying the same thing, then as you're speaking, you're going to throw in phrases that they say, which actually aren't in the scripture nor necessarily accurate. The reason this is dangerous is it kind of misses the full aspects of the gospel. Uh, people miss out on blessing and teachers incur greater judgment. So that's kind of not a good idea. So if we take a look at the scriptures, we'll find out what the gospel is and then how we're supposed to respond to it. So I'll talk a little bit about how we're going to respond to it this week and more on next week. The title is True Gospel, Good News and Bad News. Um, it's good news for those who accept it and embrace it and obey it. They notice in first Thess, I don't even want to touch this, uh, 1.8, it says obey, second line down. Uh, you're supposed to believe the gospel, but you're also supposed to obey the gospel. So you kind of wonder, how, does, how are you supposed to obey that Jesus died for your sins? So stay tuned and we'll find out. So the gospel of the kingdom, that's the kingdom promised in the Old Testament, is uh, the major emphasis of scripture. There are also references to the gospel of the grace of God or the gospel of God. Um, that's the second line down there. The third line is pretty common. Gospel of the Messiah. And uh, as most of you know, I like to, instead of translating it Christ, people think that Christ is just part of Jesus' name. It's actually a title, and it often has the definite article, the, in front of it. And it's talking about the Messiah that was promised in the Old Testament, which has a whole lot of context with it that um, almost no one pays attention to. A couple times it's called the Gospel of Peace. Um, and once and only once, it's called the gospel of salvation in Ephesians 1.13, and we'll look at that again next week, and you'll see that uh, it's not talking about justification. It's called the gospel of glory a few times, and the gospel of the age, uh, and the response there is to fear. So what about Jesus dying for your sins? Isn't that in the gospel? Well, yeah, it's a part of it, but it's not the necessarily the biblical emphasis um, as you go through the scriptures. Roman numeral one, good news, that's what the word gospel means, uh, of the kingdom promised in the Old Testament opens up each gospel. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all herald back or hark back to John the Baptist as the herald um, who is giving um, a message that there's good news coming, and he roots it in Isaiah 40, as most of you know, uh, particularly in verse 10. So we'll look at that when we get there. And the good news is 
also about how to be blessed in that kingdom. That was the main message of Jesus and the apostles. So he said, repent. That means you've got to change your mind about how living in this life, as if it's the only thing there is, and start living as if there is a kingdom coming in which God rewards righteousness. Message of John the Baptist, message of Jesus, the message of the apostles see it, that he sent out, see the message of Paul. Uh, Jesus' first sermon in the Sermon on the Mount, there's no message of cross or blood or forgiveness it, well, of sins by God. It's all about how to get blessed or rewarded in the kingdom. Blessed are you, blessed are you, blessed are you. It kind of should make some sense. Um, so, in the Old Testament, going back to Isaiah 40, particularly verse 10, is something everybody should be aware of. Uh, comfort my people. It's God talking about the times when uh, he would restore and regather the nation of Israel and bring the promised blessings of the Messiah's rule into the nation of Israel. Um, most people think that Jesus is going to come back to take us to heaven. I think the more biblically accurate view is he's coming back to set up a kingdom on earth. And uh, those are two very, very different things. If he's going to be setting up a kingdom on earth, then we need to be cognizant of what's supposed to happen in that kingdom, what role we play. And if you read the Apostle Paul, it's pretty obvious uh, what that is. If you pay attention to Jesus' sermons, it's pretty obvious what that is. But the gospel is used a number of times in the Old Testament. Um, passage in 52, 7 of Isaiah. How beautiful on uh, the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. That's the gospel. Who proclaim peace. That must be an element of the good news. Who bring glad tidings of good things. Who proclaim salvation. Who says to Zion, your God reigns. So Zion is used of both the nation of Israel and uh, the city of Jerusalem. And if you, I understand this concept of good news that's listed here, it's he's going to save his people from their difficulties and he's going to reign over them. And that was the role of the Messiah to come and reign. Of course, if you don't read the Old Testament or don't understand the Old Testament, uh, you kind of totally miss that. And 90% of the people who preach and teach in churches and Bible colleges and seminaries say that they have never read the entire Old Testament uh, or the entire Bible, which would include the Old Testament, which is kind of tragic because they missed the context. So this good news in Isaiah 52 in verse 8, which follows verse 7, hey, putting how that works. Uh, when the Lord brings back Zion, restores them, uh, he has redeemed Jerusalem. Yahweh has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all the nations all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of God, and he's going to be leading his people. So that points to a yet future time when this is going to happen. So now we got a little tension between, well, what about the good news for us now and the good news for the future? And hopefully that will be resolved by looking at the scripture. So the big idea is the good news of the kingdom promised in the Old Testament is the gospel. Um, what God's promises are going to be fulfilled. And had the nation of Israel accepted them or accepted the Messiah, uh, he would have figured out a way to get his Gentiles in there and uh, he would have set up his kingdom as promised. But we're still awaiting that. Of course, huge volumes of Christianity, probably the majority of them, don't believe that there's going to be this future kingdom promised in the Old Testament and that God has somehow given up on all that stuff. But um, he's very careful about keeping his promises. Now, in Isaiah's last half, 61 is in that last half, we have a passage that was quoted by Jesus uh, as sermon in synagogue at Nazarene, his hometown. And theologians are fond of making up names for things, so they call this the Nazarene Manifesto. Uh, in Isaiah 61, we read, The Spirit of the Lord, Yahweh, is upon me. So that's the Lord Yahweh, um, because Yahweh has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. Uh, some versions say meek, humble, uh, or in spirit, those kind of folks. He sent me to heal or bind up the brokenhearted. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, which could be uh, not just people caught in sin, but uh, those in captivity. Um, 
and dispersed because of their disobedience. That would be the Jews. And then an interesting little phrase here, the opening of eyes to them that are bound. Um, prison is added in uh, the translation. In chapter 42, 7 of Isaiah and Jesus' quote in Luke 4, 18, he basically separates the opening eyes of the blind and uh, like makes release from prison to those who are bound. So the original word was talking about people who um, were in darkness in prison, uh, figurative spiritual prison probably is meant, um, and then it gets expanded to perhaps uh, literal prisons by breaking out you know, the eyes. If you're in prisons, you know, they didn't have lighting in there, so uh, it was dark. And uh, most people are still living in darkness. Um, they don't see the light, and that's why Jesus is the light, and he sends us to be light. So, since most people jump to 1 Corinthians 15 and says, oh, that's the gospel. Jesus died, was buried, and was resurrected. Um, all according to the scriptures. So, that's uh, the gospel. You kind of need to put Paul's writing to the Corinthians in the context of why he was an apostle and what he says in his other letters. And then you can kind of, you know, make sure that what you're interpreting is accurate and consistent and therefore true. So I pick Romans 1.16 uh, at the top, um, or 17, as the passage for this sermon because uh, it's memorized in the TMS. You know, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of God. It's the uh, power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also the Greek. And uh, actually, it's going to be down below. So I'm putting this in this context. And Paul writes to the Romans. He had never visited there, but there are believers, both Jew and Gentile. And he says that through uh, God, we have received grace and it's like power, authority, and apostleship. Um, for the purpose of bringing about obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. And this concept of bringing about obedience to the faith is the major theme in Romans. It's going to show up again in chapter 16. It's the bookends, and it's what he talks about throughout the book. It's not a book written to how to get your sins forgiven. It's written like most of the, all well, but one half of one letter of the New Testament, are written to people who already believed, telling them how to live as believers. And the Holy Spirit guided people to include uh, aspects of Jesus's ministry that um, believers should be aware of. Only the first half of John is explicitly written to uh, those who have not yet exercised faith. And then he mentions that uh, among these nations are you, who are the called or invited of Jesus Christ. Uh, just like I think uh, swapping out uh, Christ for Messiah helps you better understand the text. Uh, swapping out called for invited is the better way to understand the scriptures. People are invited to partake of the blessings that God offers. Um, there's perversions of Theology of the scriptures and various forms of theology, which thinks that only some people are called. Um, the scriptures are kind of clear that whoever wants to, let them come and drink, uh, partake of the feast and banquet that God has planned. So every time I see called, I will uh, switch it in my mind uh, to invite it, and it helps me understand the context a little better. Uh, do the same thing with uh, chosen and select, but uh, it's another story. So he's just the apostle. Uh, that was you know, personally deputized by Jesus Christ to do a task, writing in verse 7, to all who are in Rome, who are beloved of God, who are called or invited to be saints. And now he gives his wish for them, which kind of gives you a clue as to why he's writing. May grace and peace be to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus, the Messiah. He wants people to get grace and peace. Grace is not something that's static, it's dynamic. It's got past, present, and future aspects. Past in that your sins were forgiven. Present in that you get power to be sanctified. And future in that you get uh, favor and glory when Christ returns. And he also wants peace, which is a covenantal blessing. 
Um, just look at Phineas. God grants him a covenant of peace for his service um, with his uh, picking work in the Old Testament. So Paul's writing, and I want to. He says he's received grace and apostleship, and I want to go back to how this actually happened. And I think everybody, particularly those who teach, need to go and understand Paul's commission, which he gives us in Acts 26, to understand why he's writing the letters. So I fit everything that he writes into his purpose for being an apostle. Um, we have the purpose in one, Romans 1.5, 1, but let's go back to the actual words of Jesus in Acts 26.15. Uh, Paul's been knocked off his donkey, he's blind, and he hears a voice, and he says, Who are you, Lord? And the voice answers, uh, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Whoa. <laughs> I think Paul's a little nervous here. And then Jesus goes on to say, I have appeared to you for this purpose. Ooh, ooh. We're going to find out why Jesus knocked Paul off his donkey and appeared to him which is the next verse. I appeal to you for this purpose, to make you a minister and a witness, both of the things which you have seen and the things which I will re reveal to you in 14 years of uh, hanging out in the desert with me. So uh, Paul is going to basically relate this story and all the other things that God taught him, which he went to Jerusalem and bounced off the apostles to make sure he was doing okay. And God goes on to say, I'm going to deliver you from the Jewish people, because they're going to be attacking you, as well as from the Gentiles, who will also attack you, uh, to whom I'm now sending you to do this. I want you to open their eyes in order to turn them from darkness to light. And remember, Jesus was proclaiming good news to those who lived in darkness to come into the light. Um, and beginning of Luke, I think it's Simeon, says something along the same lines of, you know, now people in darkness have seen a great light. Jesus is the light of the world. He gives light so you can see things accurately. And then this gets elaborated to turn people, well, people think you know, this could be a second thing, from the power of Satan to the power of God. He's changed our citizenship. We no longer live in the kingdom of Satan. Although we live in his world, our allegiance is now transferred to God and we obey his rules. Uh, another purpose, I think, is that they may receive forgiveness of sins. So as you uh, get removed from darkness and light, from the power of Satan to God, you find and receive forgiveness of sins. And, but wait, there's more. And this is a big deal in the New Testament. Uh, I think there are more verses about this than there are about forgiveness of sins. And receive, may receive, an inheritance among everybody who says, I believe in Jesus. Nah, not quite. An inheritance among those who are sanctified, made holy by belief or faith in what Jesus revealed. Um, people who just say, I believe in Jesus, don't usually get holy as a result of that. Um, there's a whole New Testament that's written telling you how to be holy. There's the Spirit of God put within you to willing to do God's good pleasure rather than your own good's pleasure. So that's what the New Testament is about, to get these people holy or sanctified. And I'm going to take a look at Paul's uh, speech in Acts 20, which in the order of Acts uh, you know, precedes this, but in the chronology of Paul's life actually follows this when he gives this farewell speech to the Ephesian elders. And just to, before I leave this, I want to take a look at verse 20, which is the next aspect of Paul describing what his ministry was in uh, 16 and 17, he tells you, you know, what Jesus said to him. And then in 20, he relates uh, what he actually did. I declared that people should repent. Hey, very much like John the Baptist. Turn to God and do works befitting a repentance. So Paul said in Ephesians 2.10, we're saved to do good works. Uh, he says in Titus, people must be careful to maintain good works. Uh, John, First John says, faith without works is dead. Uh, believers are supposed to do works. And, of course, the theologians hijack this to say, well, let's see, is, is faith a work or not? I mean, is believing a work? It's something you do. It's not the work that God planned for you to do uh, when he talks about what good works are in the scriptures. And, by the way, on daily 
on Truth Base, there's a sermon on good works that pull you that in. So let's go back to 20 of Acts. Ephesian elders, farewell speech, uh, weeping because we're not going to see him again. And uh, Paul says, I kept back nothing from you that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house. Um, so Paul is saying, I'm guilty of the blood of no man. I told you the whole story. That's verse 26. I didn't keep back anything that was helpful. And this is kind of what preachers are supposed to do. They're supposed to figure out what's helpful for people, what's beneficial, and tell them both in big group settings and from house to house. Uh, so apparently they had house churches or small group Bible studies or whatever, but uh, both public and private uh, ministers of God's word, servant of God is supposed to be sharing what is helpful to people. And if it's not helpful, why are they sharing it? Beats me. I don't know. Testifying to Jews and also to the Greeks of the need for repentance, changing your mind towards God. Um, this life is not about me. It's about him. And faith toward our Lord Jesus, the Messiah. The guy promised in the Old Testament. So then he goes on to talk about a couple of verses about insight and wisdom. Uh, Revelation that the Holy Spirit gave him, which basically says, Paul, you're going to get beat up um, everywhere you go. And uh, so his response to this is, ah, none of this stuff moves me. I don't count my life as dear to myself. All I want to do is finish my race or my course with joy. He wants to be your well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of your master, and faithfully discharge the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. Um, I want to just pause there. If you notice on the outline, it has grace slash favor. And this is another one of those words that when people read it, uh, they have a think thought about grace like God's riches at Christ's expense. That's just one aspect of it. And I think people's spiritual lives would be greatly benefited if they would swap out grace and put favor in its place and realize that God's favor is his blessing. And just like um, humans, we do favors for each other. Um, and we grant favor to those with whom we are on good terms. So God makes it really clear in both Testaments that although he has some general grace or favor of sending rain and you know, the seasons and some other good stuff, he only blesses those who meet his requirements for blessing. And you know, all you need is one piece of information that should uh, totally support this in your mind. With the nation of Israel at the end of Deuteronomy, he sets forth blessing and cursing and says, if you obey, here's how I will bless you. But if you disobey, here's how I will curse or diminish or make your life of no account. So Paul is testifying to the good news of the favor of God towards men. And there were actually some angels that kind of sung this. We do Christmas uh, hymn on this. Uh, Glory to God on in the highest and uh, peace on earth to men on whom his favor rests. King James calls it men of goodwill, uh, which kind of implies, well, if you just be a hearty and hail fellow, then, you know, God will bless you. No, it's ones to whom his, on whom his favor rests. And that isn't everybody. He's not favorable toward those who rebel against him, who ignore him, who deny that he exists, who deny that he has spoke, spoken, who twist and pervert his words. Um, he's not favorable towards them. And people need to understand that, that, um, our relationship with God is uh, one that is based upon hesed or mutual covenant fulfillment. And if you don't get that, you haven't read the Old Testament, nor have you accurately read the New Testament. So he goes on to say, 26, I am innocent of the blood of all men because I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Um, so before I get to one of my favorite verses, let me just bring this thought to your mind, that had Paul 
not declare to people the whole counsel of God, the whole plan of God, the whole purposes of God, what God was doing, if he did not declare that, he would sh basically share in the guilt of those people who haven't repented, turned around, and done what is right. And uh, it seems like one of the requirements in the job description of most uh, preachers is don't say anything that will upset the major donors in the church. <laughs> don't say anything that will upset the church ladies who will gossip about all the things that you say that they don't like. Um, don't say anything that will offend anybody. And, and you just see how in our culture right now, uh, free speech is being compromised by, well, what you say might offend someone. But sometimes if you want to find truth, you have to say some things that are uncomfortable for people or they don't like so that they will actually take a look at the truth and embrace it as opposed to always hiding from it. So now, brethren, verse 32, last words to them. Actually, there's a little bit more about bad guys coming both from within the church and without the church to kind of ruin the flock. Now, brethren, I commend you to God and the word of his grace or favor. And if we fully understand grace, we're going to recognize it is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all who are sanctified. So this word of God's favor or grace is not just that Jesus died for your sins, but it's something that actually edifies you, builds you up, makes you more like Jesus, like add to your faith, you know, uh, diligently add to your faith, uh, moral excellence and patience and long suffering and fruits of the spirit and brotherly kindness and eventually agape love. So it builds you up and this word of his favor is both the uh, motivation and the power to gain the inheritance because it's the stuff that helps you get sanctified. So that was what Paul declared. That's what we should be helping people do, uh, figure out how to get built up and how to get inheritance by the virtue of being sanctified. Ergo, they need to basically learn how to be holy. Okay, back to, now we understand that that's kind of Paul's purpose. Build up people, make sure they get an inheritance. Let's look at how he continued his um, letter to the Romans. And uh, Roman numeral, uh, whatever it is, to be, Paul preached the gospel to believers. <laughs> and unfortunately, that's what they do a lot of churches. Uh, when I first, so not having grown up in uh, a particular tradition, I basically gathered my understanding of, you know, a relationship with God from the scriptures. And then I also kind of went and explored what was going on in churches. And uh, every time I turn, drive and turn on my radio and listen to radio preachers, I just like shake my head and thought, oh, man, God, how, how do you keep letting this go on? But when I first went down to Dallas, uh, I'd go around to churches and I kind of put together what um, people did for church down there. Uh, they showed up every Sunday to make sure that salvation was still by faith. And then they said, okay, I got that. See you next week. Because every single sermon I ever heard would end with an altar call, um, which undid any ethical imperatives that were shared in the sermon. And uh, people basically are now saying, okay, the punchline, what should I do? Oh, believe in Jesus? Got that. And I, you know, I probably four or five times as I'm driving and I'm flipping between stations because the signals are kind of weak down here. Um, I would hear people say something about, all you have to do is trust Jesus and all your problems go away. Well, that's false advertising because the scripture says if you trust Jesus, your problems are just going to start. <laughs> well, whole of godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. Uh, God tests the righteous. God causes the impurities to boil up into the top of your life so they can be skimmed off and you can actually shine brightly for him. And that actually is going to be viewed as more problems. And just like a little toddler, we think, oh, if God gives me difficult situations, he doesn't love me. No, it's because he loves you that he tests your faith. And uh, just a couple days ago in James, I uh, read, count it pure joy when you encounter various trials. And uh, I have to admit, I don't count it pure joy. Um, I kind of view it as, well, it's not as bad as it could be. You know, I'm sure good is going to come out of this. Um, my view of pure joy is, you know, jumping up and down, hooting and hollering for 
not that I do that a lot, because I'm just like overwhelmed with uh, this concept of happiness. But that isn't exactly what joy is. So I'm working on getting a little more joyful over uh, the wonderful trials that God brings into my life. So I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of through the whole world. I long to see you, you whose faith is spoken of throughout the whole world, faith in Jesus, right? That I might impart to you some spiritual grace thing, charisma. Um, he's basically help telling them how to get more grace. Uh, that's also sometimes translated uh, gift. But uh, charis is grace, ma is thing, grace thing. It's a gift, but there's also much more to it than that. And he's doing that so you might be established, strengthened, made firm in your faith. And then elaborates, that is, I want to be encouraged together with you by the mutual faith of both you and me. Okay, so the Romans have faith? Yes. Do they have real authentic faith? Do they really believe? Yep, they believe really just like Paul does. Huh, all right, so these guys are real believers. And he wants to minister to them so you might have some fruit among them also. So, as much as it was in me, and if God permits, I am ready to preach the good news to you who are in Rome also. Okay, wait a minute, but they're, they're already saved. They already have their sins forgiven. Why, why does he need to preach the good news to them? Because the good news isn't all about Jesus died for your sins. It's about God blesses those who are rightly related to him. And I am not ashamed of the good news of the Messiah who was promised in the Old Testament. Because this good news is actually the power of God to bring about salvation for everyone who believes. doesn't matter if you're a Jew or a Greek. First went to the Jews, now it's going to the Greeks. I should pause here to recognize that salvation has three different meanings. Uh, you can find them in Thayer's lexicon. Or you could find it by just using a concordance and searching out. Um, the one where you get your sins forgiven, we normally refer to that as justification, but not every use of justification is about getting your sins forgiven. Second aspect, which is on, that's done to settle past God's graces gift to us in Christ. But then there's this bestowment of his Holy Spirit, which is the power to lead a holy life, and that's sanctification. But the best is yet to come. First uh, Peter chapter 1, clear, clear chapter on this. So uh, if you're listening to this uh, on the tape and you haven't ever studied First Peter chapter 1, please do so. And you will embrace the concept that it's the praise, glory, and honor that is going to be given to the saints who faithfully endure when Christ returns. Um, in this gospel, the righteousness of God, what he requires is unveiled. Uh, the word for revealed really means to like uncover something that's hidden. And um, it's basically Paul's concept of the mystery is there was truth in the Old Testament that was kind of not seen clearly and now he is unveiling that. And it is this righteousness that God requires is ek faith, ice faith. It comes out of faith and it goes, continues in faith at the end. I think Maybe the NIV has got a good translation on this one. It's faith from beginning to end. So you have faith to start, but you have faith to end. And if you have an alternative translation, like it's the faith of the Jews to that of the Greeks, go into daily truth base. And I debunk that one and reiterate the correct translation. As it's written, the just, the U-S-T, underline and bolded, and we should pay attention to that, shall live by faith. Hmm. Okay, why do he bold it and underline it? Maybe it's important. Uh, it's a quote from Habakkuk. Habakkuk is kind of waiting for God to judge the Israelites because they're such bad believers and good sinners. So he wants God to judge. He says, how long, O oh Lord? And then God says, um, well, I'm bringing Babylon to judge him. And Habakkuk says, nah, you, but, but, but you can't use Babylon. Uh, they're more wicked than we are. And God says, I know what I'm doing. Take a look. And then the, the just, which in the original context is Habakkuk and people who are just, shall live by faith. Okay, it does not say that the unjust 
shall live by faith. It doesn't say that the unbelievers shall live by faith, but those who are already just by exercising faith in God's promises shall in the future continue to live, um, possibly a reward context, by exercising faith in what God's said. Okay, so this is not saying unjust live by faith, but just live by faith. Uh, what about the unjust? Well, he's writing to people who have already believed that have the same faith he does. Don't forget the context. And the reason you need to live by faith is because not only is the righteousness that God desires revealed, so is the wrath that he's going to pour out on those who don't believe. That's why this can be bad news as well. Uh, in the revelation of God, there's good news and bad news. Good news for those who accept it, bad news for those who don't. Um, so I'm going to jump to the bookend at the back. So remember up front he said, I was an apostle um, to bring about the obedience that comes from faith. And I think this is almost like the last verse in the book, Romans 16, 25. Now to him who is able to establish you according to my gospel. Okay, remember he talked up, up above of uh, he wants to establish them, get them strong, and, and it's according to the message and the preaching of Jesus, the Messiah, which is in accord with the revelation of the mystery kept secret since the world began, but made manifest in these last times for obedience to the faith. So front and back end of the book, he's talking about bringing about obedience to the faith for those who have the faith. So as we look at Romans, we should be looking for how does this apply to believers? And of course, you know, someone came up with a simplified version for simpletons of uh, the Roman road and you know, takes a bunch of verses in Romans out of context to try to get people saved, um, which, you know, God works. You know, he did, does, does talk about uh, he loved us and sent his son to die for our sins. So. Uh, and you need to say Savior, according to chapter 3, that other one was chapter 5. Um, the one in chapter 6 is clearly in a sanctification context, so it's a little illegitimate, but hey, if people get saved by it, go for it. Okay, here's some more of the bad news. If you look at the, um, the last verse on this screen, Romans 2.16, there's a day when God is going to judge the secrets of men according to Paul's gospel. So uh, I guess you gals are off the hook. But uh, let's go up and see what Romans 2, 5, 2, 5 say. Um, in accordance with your hardness and your in, impenitent heart. In other words, not repenting. So they have a hard heart. These are people who suppress the truth in unrighteousness because they knew the truth. They didn't obey it. Uh, they turned the glory of God into you know, a lie. Um, in accord with their hard heart, when that's not sensitive and not tender to God, they are not treasuring up for themselves treasure in heaven, like Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, but they, believers, are treasuring up for themselves wrath in the day of wrath and a revelation or manifestation of the righteous judgment of God. So God is going to manifest his righteous judgment. He's suffering and you know, to, to, to basically judge when we step out of line. He's forbearing, uh, but that doesn't go on forever. And people who have a hard heart, who are not sensitive to God's word, who, when confronted with the word, don't respond to it, are going to be facing wrath. Because when Jesus comes back, they're going to experience the wrath of the Lamb, when he renders to everyone according to their deeds. Bad deeds, bad wrath. Good deeds, good glory. He's going to give according to people's deeds, and here's not their belief, their deeds. Eternal life. How do you get that? Oh, you just believe in Jesus. Well, no, Paul actually says you have to do something different. To those who by patient continuance in doing good, seek for glory, honor, and immortality. It looks like you have to be purposeful in how you live and purposely live for glory, honor, and immortality, which is brought to you according to 1 Peter chapter 1 at the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's given to us. It's actually called the grace or favor that's going to be given to us. 
So some people go around doing random acts of kindness. They need to be thinking, is this really God's will? And will it result in glory? Uh, if you're not seeking for stuff, I don't think you're going to stumble on it by accident. Because Satan has kind of set up this world, so you wind up going in mazes and doing the wrong things. So you need to be seeking for uh, glory, honor, and immortality. The alternative to seeking for glory, honor, and immortality is you seek for, which are the eternal blessings, temporal blessings, and you're self-seeking. So this is New King James translation. Nice little, what do you seek for? Instead of seeking for glory, you're seeking for basically self-aggrandizement. And self-seekers do not obey, follow, submit to the truth. But they obey, follow, or submit to unrighteousness. And what do they get? They don't get praise, glory, honor. They get indignation and wrath, which elaborates upon tribulation and anguish on every soul of man, good thing you gals are left off the hook, who does evil of the Jew first and also of the Greek. And then he reiterates glory, honor, and peace. Oh, look, there's a covenant of blessing, peace. Something you get in the future. Cessation of hostilities, being able to enjoy um, the relationship with God. To everyone who works what is good. Oh, uh, yeah, work. You got to do that. You have to know what's good and then do it. And persevere in doing it. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. For there's no partiality with God. It's not the hearers of the law that are just in God's sight, but the doers of the law will be justified. Yikers, justified. By what you do. Um, I thought you had to believe to be justified. Well, yeah, you do have to believe to be justified. Maybe this use of justification isn't talking about your sins being forgiven. Because I don't see anything in here about the blood and the cross and faith in Jesus as your Savior. I see a lot in here about Jesus as your Lord. So here's the use of justified that probably refers to um, being declared righteous, which has different aspects, and being right in God's sight is something that you want to have happen at the judgment seat. Uh, it's not something that causes you to go into the lake of fire, but it's something that causes you to get reward or lack of reward. And that's going to happen in the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. So here's Paul's gospel. God's going to come back and he's going to judge. He's going to judge the intent, the ambitions, the motivations, the why you do what you do. And he knows and you can't fool him which is why it's a good idea to live in the fear of God. So, good news, God has glory, honor, and immortality to those who seek for it. Bad news, he's got wrath, indignation, tribulation, anguish on those who are self-seeking and don't obey. That's his good news. So, it's really good if you're doing what's good, and it's really bad if you're doing what's bad. I'm going to skim through this one fast because I want to get to 1 Corinthians 15 before we run out of time. Um, God blesses the faithful, those people who are full of faith. Right? That's why there's a hyphen there. I kind of had to fight with my spell checker to get that up there. Um, so in his best pastoral manner, he writes to the Galatians in chapter 3, 1, Oh, foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? that you should not obey the truth. Okay, so um, what do you think this chapter is about? Galatians being foolish, possibly being deceived and blinded by Satan, bewitched. It's not the TV show, for those of you who remember that. Um, and it's probably going to be about obeying the truth, which they're not doing. Hmm, they're obeying something else. And the thing that they're obeying is actually something good if you read the context. Um, they're being tempted to follow the Jewish law as opposed to continue by faith in what the Messiah has revealed. Foolish Galatians, who has uh, be bewitched you that you should not obey the truth before whom's eyes Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified? So Paul did preach Jesus and him crucified. Totally, that's how you get your sins forgiven. And then these Galatians believe that message. And guess what happened? The Spirit of God came to dwell in them with some outward manifestations back in the day. So he says, did you receive the Spirit by doing the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? 
So now we have contrasted the Jews who basically say, oh, you got to be circumcised and follow the law of Moses if you want to be right in God's sight. Versus Paul and the apostles of Jesus saying, no, you need to believe what God has revealed and that is fulfilled in Christ so you don't have to follow that ceremonial law stuff. But there does happen to be immoral aspects of the law that you still are going to be judged on. Are you so foolish? Shh, Paul, I thought you weren't supposed to call people fools. Having begun in the spirit. Oh, wow. They had the spirit. They began the Christian life. But people came in and told them untrue things. So they were being told that you're made perfect or brought to completion by deeds of the flesh. But wait a minute. I thought you just said in Romans that you're supposed to do good deeds. Yeah, but the good deeds that are recorded um, in the scriptures for New Testament believers to do, empowered by the Holy Spirit. They were actually, you know, such good believers, they were suffering many things. And here's, suffering is meritorious. So there's a sermon on truth based about stupid suffering and smart suffering. And smart suffering is stuff that gains you reward and holiness and all sanctification and other stuff. Stupid suffering is consequences for dumb things that you did and continue to do. Verse 5, he who supplies the Spirit to you and works miracles among you, does he do it by the works of the law or by the hearing of faith? So if you looked at Judaism, there weren't a whole lot of miracles going on there. You look at Christianity back in the day, there were lots of miracles going on there. And then he harkens back to the fact that our forefather in the faith, Abraham, believed God, and that's what got him accounted as righteous and thus set up for blessing um, through faith. Gen uh, uh, Genesis 15, 6. Therefore, know that only those who are of faith are the sons of Abraham. So we need to be people who believe God's promises and act on them, like Abraham did. And the scriptures, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel to Abraham beforehand. Wow, that makes Genesis uh, 12, I guess, um, the first mention of the gospel. But you have to wait till Galatians to find that out. He preached the uh, good news to Abraham beforehand, saying, In you, all the nations will be blessed. So I think I probably am justified in saying that the good news is that God will bless people rightly related to him. So those who are rightly related to him by faith are blessed with the believing Abraham. And he throws in our verse from Habakkuk again. Because the just, those people who are already saved, shall continue to live by faith in God's promises. Okay, now we get to the full gospel. Um, this is a phrase that I put in here deliberately. Um, there's some people who think that there's the gospel, get your sins forgiven. But the full gospel is you got to get the Holy Spirit. Um, I just refer those people to Acts one thirteen that basically says, you heard, you believed, you received the Holy Spirit. Boom, done, settled. So 1 Corinthians 15, um, every article I skimmed went to here to explain what the gospel is. And they missed the context of what 1 Corinthians 15, I probably have a couple sermons on truth base about this, and no one, absolutely no one, dealt with the first two verses. They just jump right into verse 3. Uh, I delivered to you, first of all, that which I also received, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And then we have a little mini altar call. You have to believe that Jesus died for your sins. Um, and then you have to believe he was buried. And then you have to believe that he rose again. And then everything's good. All right, let's pick up a little context. Let's go right in three to pick up the context. Died for our sins according to the scriptures. What scriptures? Well, you have to know Isaiah 53. All context, the Messiah would come and die. Jesus actually pointed to this, that being numbered among the transgressors was one of the things that needed to be fulfilled concerning him. He was buried and he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Uh, rising according to the scriptures. You go to Acts 2, you see Peter's speech. He quotes Psalm 16, that God would not permit his Holy One to see corruption, but resurrected him because he was holy. So right now we've got 
a little bit more that actually is in there about the gospel. And then he was seen by Cephas, that's Peter, and then the 12 and a bunch of other people, blah, blah, blah. The rest of the letter goes on to explain the implications of the resurrection because people were denying that Christ was resurrected and they denied that we would be resurrected because they are worldlings and saying, this life is all there is. And I was kind of amazed at the number of times on the cruise I would have to be in conversations with people who would reflect this sentiment, actually 10 times, at least 10 conversations on this, that uh, this life's all there is. There's nothing else. So do whatever you want in this life because that's it. And that's actually what Paul's going to say. Paul says in 31 of this passage, I die daily. If I have fought with beasts in Ephesus, what advantage, what profit, what reward is it to me? If the dead do not rise, if we don't get resurrected and judged, then let's eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. People who say you're not resurrected and judged are ignorant of Daniel 12, 13, right at the beginning. He says, some who are wise are going to rise uh, to glory, uh, others to shame and contempt. But I want to go back and pick up the context of verses 3 and 4. So that's 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Believers, brethren, I declare to you the gospel that I preach to you. Ooh, ooh, what did Paul preach? This is the thing that you received and in which you stand. So he preached, they believed, they accepted it, they believed that Jesus died for their sins, and whatever else he said, and they're standing, that's their current condition, they're established in it. And then he says, by which also, oh, that's a different thing, also, you are saved. Huh? I'm not saved yet? I, I thought, my sister were given, I'm saved. Well, yeah, but they're different aspects of salvation. But you're saved if, 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 conditional. You hold fast that word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain to no profit. Okay, so there's people who incorrectly think that all you have to do is hold fast to the belief that Jesus died for your sins and the Father accepts it. And at the end of your life, you um, are still, if you are still holding to the fact that Jesus died for your sins, then you get saved. But that's not what this chapter is about. This chapter is about getting glory. It's the glorification aspect. I actually on the cruise heard uh, there were three unbelievers having a conversation um, about uh, oh, little kids. Uh, you know, they're five or six years old and they were exposed to um, a video or movie or something about um, people who would wait until the end of their lives to get um, baptized and believe so they could then go into the eternal state sinless. Um, so they heard um, the message that uh, God judges sin uh, and they knew that Jesus was the solution and they also knew that it was not good to sin as a believer so they would wait until they were just about ready to die and then they would receive communion and, you know, uh, confess their sins, and then they could go into heaven with a clean slate. Um, but they kind of miss out on that, like, what about the good works that you're supposed to do? What about letting your light shine? What about serving others and imitating Christ and all that other good stuff? And the people on the cruise are talking about how little kids could see how bogus that was. Um, and if the little kids could see it, then clearly we as big people should see that it's bogus and totally reject all that Christianity has to offer. Um, I would go up until that last line. We should see that it's bogus and totally embrace all that Christianity has to offer by living accurately according to the truth. So he goes on in this passage uh, to say, if the dead, or, uh, end of verse uh, 32, do not rise, let's eat and drink for tomorrow we die and there's nothing but then he talks about glory he says don't be deceived because satan's going to deceive you evil company corrupts good habits or morals or intentions depending on your version so hang around the good people don't hang around the bad people then he tells these people who already believed and are standing in the gospel that he preached 
awake to righteousness. Duh, you're still in the dark about what it means to live a righteous life. And better translation is stop sinning. Present imperative of stopping an action that's currently in progress. Because some do not have knowledge of God. And I would say most do not have knowledge of God because they aren't basing their knowledge of God on his word, but on hearsay. And I speak this to your shame. So if the guilt fits, wear it. And he goes on to say there are different degrees of glory. And then he concludes his chapter with, My beloved brethren, okay, people who believe, who are standing in this message of chapter 15, 1. Um, be steadfast, immovable. Don't move out of the position of truth. Be always abounding in the work of the Lord. Oh, we'll work till Jesus comes. We'll work. <laughs> Knowing that your labor will be rewarded. Your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Therefore, go seek for glory, honor, and immortality and get the eternal life that God promised, the dominion in the age to come to those who love him, which is a message all the way through the scriptures. So I'm almost out of time. I can take some questions and uh, I'm not sure if I will be able to hear you. Worst comes to worst, you can always call me and we can talk. Um, and I'll pick up the other usages of gospel next week and a little bit more about how we're supposed to respond. If you're looking for an application, figure out what kind of work God saved you to do. Remember, he saved us to do good works and then do it and don't quit until the end. Um, and then you'll live happily ever after and the gospel will be good news for you. Those who don't do that, who don't obey the gospel, will find out that the gospel is bad news for them. But don't be like that. You know, it's, you, you don't want to you don't enjoy your eternity. You don't want to regret it. Okay, questions. No, self-seeking, okay, so I think the question, yeah, I, I heard it, so it probably got recorded. So the question was, you know, you should be seeking it for other people. Uh, no, self-seeking is self-aggrandizement. You're basically seeking to enhance your ego, uh, your value in the eyes of others, and thus yourself, as opposed to seeking value um, in the eyes of God. It was Jesus who, in his first sermon, commanded believers to lay up treasure for themselves in heaven. It's a command. Why don't we preach that command? Oh, that would be selfish. Um, well, no, because Hebrews 11, people that you should study, all the greats of the faith were looking for God's blessing. And even in chapter 12 of Hebrews, um, they Jesus was looking for the joy that was set before him. Uh, Moses did all he did because he was looking ahead for his reward. Nehemiah, who didn't make it in uh, there by name, did it because he said, God, remember what I've done for you. So people who are seeking for um, God's blessing do things that are good and other-centered. People who are self-seeking are just seeking for temporal blessings for themselves, and they rarely are other-centered in their thinking. So you spot a selfish person, you spot someone who God's not going to be pleased with and uh, who isn't laying up treasure in heaven. Um, just looking at the line that Paul says, um, where he has not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God, uh, how do you, how do you uh, relate that to the idea of just sharing bits of truth with people to kind of test out their receptivity? Okay, so... Um, and I'm going to couple up the, how do you uh, couple sharing uh, bits of truth with people to test out their receptivity to another thing that goes in this category of Paul saying to the Corinthians, I was determined to know nothing among you except Jesus and him crucified. Okay, so you're testing out people's receptivity to truth normally in the sphere of unbelievers. And when people accepted Paul's message of Jesus dying for their sins and changed their mind about the Messiah, he then started sharing more with them. Uh, he's actually talking to the Ephesian elders. The Ephesians was the best taught church in the New Testament. 
Uh, they had Paul, they had John, they had Priscilla and Aquila, uh, they had, uh, and then he's talking to the most mature of those saints. So we're looking at him at a, not, you know, kind of dealing with people who you're just uh, starting to dance with about the truth, but, you know, ones who are in full swing and got their act together. In terms of the Corinthians, just, you know, sharing uh, the cross and him crucified, um, Jesus died for your sins. L look at the letters that he wrote to the Corinthians and look at how much in there is not about the cross and him crucified. Initially, that was his message. He would go and tell everybody of Jesus. Uh, he was the Messiah who died for your sins. And then as they received that, he then went on with, okay, the word of his grace, building you up, get inheritance among those who are sanctified. So you have to kind of understand the uh, context of both the person and uh, where things are in the scriptures. All right, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who is gracious and good, a God who loves to bless. Um, we thank you for creating us so that you could bless us and magnify yourself, display your glory through that. Uh, thanks for the message of the salvation that you offer us in the Messiah, um, how total and complete it is, uh, not just one-off forgiveness for our sins, but a whole life that you want to empower and sanctify and cause to shine for you. And then an eternal future that we get to share with your son Jesus uh, as we live and reign with him and others who are faithful to him. Uh, Lord, help us be bold and not ashamed of this message, sharing it with others. Uh, help us not shrink from um, interacting with those who have distorted or perverted or truncated uh, the full gospel of uh, your plan for life on this earth. May we be faithful to uh, live it and love others with it. Uh, for Christ's sake, in Christ's name, for his glory. Amen.